The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. Located on the southeast of the Sinai Peninsula, a few kilometers north of Dahab, Egypt, is the Blue Hole, a submarine sinkhole with a maximum depth of just over 328 feet. And because of that fact, because of its depth, the sinkhole has become a tourist destination where many scuba divers challenge themselves to freedive inside of the Blue Hole. And for many, it's an unforgettable experience, but unfortunately for a few, it became their last experience. And one of those people, is named Yuri Lipsky. Yuri Lipsky was a Russian-Israeli freediver and scuba diver, and he was relatively skilled. In his opinion, he felt that he was capable of freediving the Blue Hole, with one specific goal that he had in mind. He wanted to break his depth record, and the sinkhole was just deep enough for him to do that, with the plan being of him jumping immediately into the water and descending as quickly as he could, reaching a maximum depth that he hadn't reached before, and then rapidly swimming back up to not use up all of his air. This strategy to break his depth record was dangerous, to say the least. And Yuri Lipsky was advised that he should train before attempting to rapidly break his depth record. Two weeks were set aside for his training before he would visit the Blue Hole. He decided to not show up. He simply didn't have enough time. He only had the weekend to free dive the Blue Hole, so he chose to skip the training altogether. So on April 28th, 2000, Yuri Lipsky put on his scuba gear, filled one tank with a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen, and once that was complete, he turned on his camera that was attached to his helmet, and from there, he jumped into the blue hole. From there, his camera captured everything. Yuri Lipsky was traveling really fast in the water, sinking as quickly as possible, and reached a maximum depth of 91 meters. Whether or not this broke his record is unknown. What is known is that he was diving alone and overweighted. His equipment, his camera, all of it were keeping him underwater. He tried to rapidly resurface, but over time he became more and more disoriented. This was because he had improperly mixed the gases in his tank. He had one tank of oxygen and nitrogen, and the mix was not balanced. His tank contained mostly oxygen, and because of the extreme pressure of being under 91 meters of water, Yuri Lipsky was beginning to succumb to oxygen toxicity, along with nitrogen narcosis because of how little nitrogen was in his tank. Over the course of minutes, it wouldn't be long until Yuri Lipsky was at the very bottom of the blue hole. He was thrashing against the rocks and sand, obviously disoriented, and within moments, he would become motionless. That was the moment when Yuri Lipsky drowned to death at the bottom of the blue hole. His body wouldn't be recovered until a day later, and the unfortunate truth is, he's the lucky one. Of all the people to die in the blue hole, very few have actually had their bodies recovered. The other 200 are still at the bottom of the sinkhole. It's odorless, it's tasteless, and when weaponized, it can be aerosolized, it can be mixed into dirt, and it can be mixed into water. And if you had the grave misfortune of encountering this compound, you would experience immediate and permanent paralysis. The dangerous compound in question is simply called VX. It's a synthetic chemical compound that was created in the 1950s, and it's known to be the most deadly synthetic chemical that humanity has ever created. So dangerous, in fact, that most governments don't have it. They actually destroyed their stockpiles because they were so dangerous. To truly put forward the dangerousness of this chemical, most developed nations with developed governments will maintain their nuclear arsenal before they would maintain their VX arsenal. As of this year, VX has never been used in a military conflict, but yet it's still been used on people, just individuals. And today I'm going to tell you the story of one of the rare times that VX was used against another human. 
But before I start that, let me explain to you what VX truly does to your body. You see, VX is not your typical nerve agent. It's the nerve agent. When one tenth of a milligram of VX is inhaled, it begins to react with the chemicals that regulate your nervous system. The VX molecule is pretty large and pretty reactive. It either connects or destroys anything that it touches, and most of those compounds are associated with your nervous system, making it difficult for you to move anything, including your diaphragm. So many people who are exposed to VX quickly choke, then collapse onto the ground, and then while completely conscious and awake, realize quickly that they can't breathe on their own, and then they suffocate to death. This is Kim Jong-nam, the paternal half-brother of Kim Jong-un. He was born on May 10, 1971 in Pyongyang, North Korea, to one of four women known to have had children with Kim Jong-il. Kim Jong-nam would study in Moscow for most of his childhood, and he reportedly had a similar personality to his father, and was described by his aunt as being hot-tempered, sensitive, and gifted in the arts. His aunt also said in 2000 that he did not wish to succeed his father. Like Kim Jong-il, he was interested in film. He wrote scripts and short films from a young age, and his father also created a small movie set for him to use. Things would begin to change for Kim Jong-nam between the years of 1998 and 2001. This was a point of his life where he was given a lot of responsibilities within the North Korean government. He had been given the senior position in the Ministry of Public Security, and also a senior position in the North Korean Computer Committee, where he was given the goal of establishing an IT industry within the nation. By the year 2001 came around, things started to get a little bit messy for Kim Jong-nam. He was caught in Japan with a fake Chinese passport, and this was embarrassing for him. His father would come to find out that he was caught in Japan with a fake passport, and the reason why he was there wasn't for any legitimate government work, but to visit Tokyo Disneyland. This moment was very embarrassing for not only his father, but for the entire North Korean nation, and it led to some decisions being made about who was going to run the nation next after Kim Jong-il passed away. The entire Kim family and most of the North Korean government began to focus on Kim Jong-nam's half-brother, Kim Jong-un. Over the course of the early 2000s, Kim Jong-un would become more and more familiar with the inner workings of the North Korean government, with the fullest expectation that he would be given power. Kim Jong-nam, on the other hand, didn't really fight this. He understood that he was too young and too inexperienced to actually have power in the nation, and at that point he had been exiled from North Korea because he had shared some thoughts and ideologies that were aligned with capitalism as opposed to communism. It wouldn't be until 2012 when Kim Jong-nam wrote a book titled My Father Kim Jong-il and Me. This book detailed his life and his upbringing and why he was not the leader of North Korea. He mentioned how he never really had interest in becoming a leader and understood that he didn't have the skills or background necessary to really control the nation. But he also voiced his concerns about how the nation was run and how North Korea itself is in dire need of some serious reforms. This book and Kim Jong-nam's behavior outside of North Korea made North Korean officials a little nervous. With Kim Jong-nam being Kim Jong-il's son and voicing his opinions that are diametrically opposite to those of his father's wasn't a good look. So on February 13th, 2017, Kim Jong-un, the new leader of North Korea, decided to do something about his brother's behavior. Kim Jong-nam had a flight and he arrived in Malaysia on February 6, 2017. He was traveling to a resort island in Langkawi, and for the meantime, he was safe, staying there. And it wouldn't be until the 13th of February, at about 9 a.m., when he was approached by two women, one of whom was Vietnamese, while the other was Indonesian. While walking to the self-checkout desk at the Kuala Lumpur airport, these two women approached him and ambushed him with VX. They sprayed it in his face, and within moments, he was choking, sputtering, and quickly losing control of his limbs, and his balance. And from there, he would collapse onto a lounge chair and his diaphragm would stop working. He would only have a few minutes left of life before he completely suffocated to death. With his body being left in the lounge chair in a very awkward position, his knees bent at 90 degrees and his arms are splayed out. He was taken to the hospital, but that was where he was pronounced dead. He was not alive for the entire trip. The two women who were involved were quickly identified and captured. Both were charged with the murder of Kim Jong-nam, but oddly enough, their murder charges were dropped and changed to a lesser charge of voluntarily causing hurt by dangerous weapons or means, and received a sentence of three years and four months. The two women were released from prison in 2019. 
There was a large international reaction to this very blatant assassination, and from there, many government's intelligence organizations were doing their own investigations as to why Kim Jong-un did this, with the United States concluding that actually Kim Jong-nam may have been killed not because of his personal ideologies, but because of who he was working with when he was staying in the United States. Allegedly, Kim Jong-nam was a CIA informant who was being paid $120,000 a year to give up information on the Kim family and the inner workings of the North Korean government. Located in the countryside of Colombia is the small town of Armero, and as of 2005, 12,000 people had lived there, and these people have suffered a lot of pain trying to stay in this spot because it's at the foot of a very active volcano. Nevado del Ruiz is a large stratovolcano that periodically erupts, with its first eruption taking place over 150,000 years ago. The volcano usually generates Vulcan to Polynian eruptions. This leads to the creation of pyroclastic flows, which is a mix of hot gases and rocks that would pour down the side of the mountain. And following that pyroclastic flow is a lahar, which consists of water, trees, rocks, mud, dissolved gases, and any living being that was picked up by the fast moving water and mud. This occurs because the mountain is typically covered in glaciers. And when a volcanic eruption occurs, all of that water melts, and immediately the water cascades down the mountain, washing everything out of its way. And that's exactly what happened on November 13th, 1985. By September of 1985, seismic measurements had been taken at the base of the mountain, and the tremors were significant. Many of the townspeople knew that another eruption was imminent, and immediate evacuation was mandatory. It wouldn't be until less than a month later that the eruption occurred. It was small, but it melted 5 to 10% of the ice cap that covered the top of the mountain. And from that, it triggered a serious lahar. Running at the speed of roughly 25 miles per hour, the mud flow reached the town and covered 85% of Armero in thick, heavy sludge. People were buried instantly. Houses were destroyed and buried completely. While some people were lucky enough to only suffer injuries, most of the town's people perished. As many as 25,000 people died. And unfortunately, many of them did not have an instant death. A lot of them weren't buried completely. Many of them were trapped under debris and forced to live many days in freezing water. And the name of one of those unfortunate souls was Omira Sanchez. Omira Sanchez lived in the neighborhood of Santander, located in Armero. She lived with her parents. Her father was named Olivero Enrique, and her mother was named Maria Alida. They were both sorghum farmers, and they worked diligently to support Omira and her brother, Olivero. And everything in their lives seemed relatively normal until November 13th. The night of the disaster, the entire family, including Omira's aunt, were in the home and they were very much awake. They were concerned about the lahar, not necessarily the eruption, and that was because there was a noticeable accumulation of glacier ice on top of the mountain. The family knew that there was going to be a devastating flood, and there was nothing that they could do about it. And once it hit, Omira became trapped under the home's concrete and other debris and couldn't free herself. Fortunately though, her head and shoulders were still above water, and she was able to scream until someone noticed her and got help. The rescuers tried to help her, but they realized her legs were trapped under the house's roof with her dead aunt's arms tightly clutched around her. And while all of this is happening, a photojournalist named Frank Fournier arrived in Bogota, and this was two days after the eruption happened. At this point, Omira had been in the water for 48 hours, and she was starting to show signs of hypothermia and gangrene. You see, the photojournalist, Frank Fournier, wanted to take pictures of the aftermath of this eruption. It had become international news when people found out that this eruption, a small eruption, had managed to kill 25,000 people. And Frank was there to take pictures of all of the gore and destruction. And by the time Fournier had reached Sanchez, she had been exposed to the elements for too long. And there was nothing that anyone could do to help her. She was just too stuck. The most that people could do was give her water and food and try their best to make sure that she was warm and comfortable. But it wasn't working. She was slowly succumbing to hypothermia. This was because, on the third night, Sanchez began hallucinating, saying that she didn't want to be late for school, and mentioned a math exam. Near the end of her life, Sanchez's eyes reddened, and her face swelled, her hands whitened, and at one point she asked the people to leave her so that she could rest. They did, and they took it as an opportunity to find something that could truly help her. Hours later, they returned with a pump, but they didn't realize just how bad her legs were. 
You see, she was bent and pinned under concrete in a weird kneeling position. Even if the water was properly drained, they would still need to remove the debris. And at that point, she didn't have a lot of time. And of course, there was the reality that maybe her legs were unsalvageable, and the rescue workers had no surgical equipment to address that. So everyone around her, in agreement, decided to just make her comfortable until things ended. And within a few hours after that, she did die, succumbing to hypothermia and gangrene on November 16th at 10.05 a.m. Her brother managed to survive the Lahars, her father and aunt died, and her mother was also able to survive. She expressed her feelings about Omira's death, quoted saying, It's horrible, but we have to think about the living. I will live for my son, who only lost a finger. Torture and execution have been a part of human society since the beginning of time. Criminals have been punished in ways unimaginable, with methods and tools that are frighteningly creative. Personally, the type of execution devices that I find fascinating are those that are meant for a specific population, or those that are designed to bring out a confession. And one of the devices that I'm going to be sharing with you today is named the Garot. This device can both be used as an assassination weapon and an execution device. So what is a garrote? What does it do? Well, it all depends on what the garrote is made out of. It can be made with different materials, including ropes, cloth, cable ties, fishing lines, nylon, guitar strings, telephone cord, or piano wire. A stick may be used to tighten the garrote, and the Spanish word refers to the stick itself. In Spanish, the term may also refer to a rope and stick used to constrict a limb as a torture device. So here's a breakdown of how a garrote would be used against you if you were an unfortunate criminal or a heretic being investigated during the Spanish Inquisition. You would be told to sit down on this wooden device and a rope would be wrapped around your neck and tied in a way that there would be a gap in the knot for a stick to be placed through. And from then on, the executioner would slowly tighten the knot by twisting the stick clockwise. The motion of the stick twisting behind you would cause the rope on your neck to tighten. And if you didn't answer any questions or confess to a crime, you would be killed that way. The rope would strangle you. But this is only one method. Sometimes the rope is wire, and sometimes there is no rope or wire at all. If you're one of the unfortunate people to be sat down in front of a metal garrote, you would be told to sit down, and then your neck would be latched into the garrote, where you might feel a little bump or spike at the base of your neck. You see, as the executioner twists the bolt behind you, that spike puts pressure on the back of your neck and will eventually go through the entirety of your neck, which would slowly and gruesomely end your life. Both methods were used primarily for execution, but they could be used for interrogation, and that occurred during the Spanish Inquisition. If you, for example, were steadfast in saying that you weren't a heretic, and the claims brought against you by the church and by others were false, there would have been a likelihood of you encountering this machine with the hopes that the pain and suffocation would encourage you to repent your sins and admit to heresy. This is a photograph of a British blacksmith removing the leg irons off of a slave in 1907. And this photograph is one of few that depict the realities of the Arab slave trade, specifically the Indian Ocean slave trade. East African peoples would be captured in raids and then sold along the East African coastline. From there, these East African slaves would be dropped off in India and Java, some of these slaves would also end up in the Caribbean, but by 1907, slavery of that nature was illegal, at least in the Western world. But in the Middle East and the Arab world, it was incredibly legal, to such an extent that many British Navy ships would go out of their way to rescue slaves and free them. One of those Navy ships was named the HMS Sphinx, and the man responsible for taking these photos was named Joseph Chidwick, and he was born in 1881. And when asked about the situation that led to this photo being taken, Chidwick had this to say. The pictures were taken while I was serving aboard the HMS Sphinx, and while on an armed patrol off the Zanzibar and Mozambique coast in about 1907, we caught quite a few slavers, and those particular slaves that are in the pictures happened while I was on watch. That night, a Dahau, an Arab sailing vessel, sailed by and the slaves were all chained together. I raised the alarm and got them onto the ship and got the chains knocked off of them. They then questioned them and sent a party of marines ashore to try and track the slave traders down. They appeared to be of Arabic origin. 
Joseph Chibwick would then go into detail about his feelings concerning slavery. I thought it was a despicable thing that was going on. The slaves were treated very badly, so when we captured the slavers, we didn't give them a very nice time. At this time, the Royal Navy patrolled East Africa and West Africa for any slave trading, and between the years of 1808 and 1860, the British Navy was able to successfully free 150,000 enslaved Africans, most of which were going to the Caribbean or to Brazil. But even in 1907, there was still a problem. East African slave trading was still an issue, but not as much as it was in the past. And over time, the British Navy became just too much of a nuisance for the Arab slave traders to make money or just outright participate in slavery. And this man, Joseph Chidwick, captured the moment in which humanity said, no more. We will no longer support human trafficking and the enslavement of others, especially for economic gain. And something about this photo, even though it is morbid, it contains an air of optimism and hope. Hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's newest installment of the r slash morbid reality series. I know many of you guys look forward to these videos once a month, but this month, you're gonna get a whole lot more. I had so many stories for this particular video that I had to break it apart into other videos. So why not take the opportunity to spoil you guys? You guys definitely deserve it. This would be the part where I thank all of my Patreon supporters for supporting content like this, cause these videos are spicy and I wouldn't be able to make them without them, but the entire website is down. So I can't read my updated list of Patreon supporters. So a big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. All of you guys make content like this incredibly possible. And if you wanna help Help support the channel go ahead and take a look at the pinned comment and description down below because for one dollar you can watch this video uncensored on patreon in that version of morbid reality 23 there will be additional videos and images that i cannot show on this platform so if you're interested in getting more context and information on the stories i've just shared with you today please take a look at the patreon and watch the full uncensored video so yeah i hope you guys enjoyed today's video and as always stay zesty